With the dollar enduring its biggest monthly percentage drop in a decade, dollar bulls need to weigh up what's next. That is this week's big conversation. Hi everybody, I'm Louisa Boyerson and welcome to The Big Conversation. After the biggest monthly percentage drop in the greenback in a decade, things are particularly interesting for dollar bulls at the moment. With the dollar down by around 10% since its March highs, it would be easy to think that what goes down must come up and vice versa, but given this more than 4% drop in the dollar index for July, how fast could a reversal trade happen? Well, we started the week and a new month with a bit of a rally, only for that rally to fizzle out. From a technical perspective, there was a massive increase in dollar shorts in the month of July to levels not seen since the height of the financial crisis almost a decade ago, so there would also have been some typical short covering taking place at the end of the month. But if you look at a dollar index chart for the last three months alone, you'll see that the biggest part of a broader drop happened, more specifically, in the second half of July. Expectations of further Fed easing have supported dollar selling also, and as markets have recovered elsewhere in part, safe haven trades in the dollar have come off too. We've also had uncertainty given a big jump in U.S. COVID-19 cases, weaker economic readings, and there's more awareness of political risk given both China-U.S. tensions and November's U.S. presidential election. I mentioned the U.S. economic readings. What's the data telling us, though? While we had signs of a recovery in May and June, the data recently points to more caution ahead. U.S. construction spending fell to a one-year low in June, surprising many as economists had forecast an increase. Although we now all know what a shutdown means and everyone was expecting a blowout drop, the historic 32.9% fall in second quarter U.S. GDP was still a shock. As a reminder, first quarter U.S. GDP showed a 5% drop. So we've gone from a 5% drop to a 33% drop. U.S. consumer spending at the end of last week led to some optimism. But while May's personal spending saw a revised print of 8.5% and June saw a jump of 5.6%, spending is still way below pre-corona readings. And inflation, well, despite initial pandemic speculation, it's hard found. The vast majority of retailers, they've been forced to slash prices to encourage sales after demand crumbled. While some economists, they still warn of inflation or even hyperinflation, many think that for the time being, the risk of inflation is very, very low. The U.S. inflation rate fell by 1.9 percent over the second quarter, having risen early in the year. The Fed's favored inflation gauge, the PCE index, rose by 0.4 percent in June, but that was mainly because of a rebound seen in gasoline prices. And the core inflation rate, so minus food and energy, is at its lowest level since the financial crisis. What will the U.S. July non-farm payroll data reveal? Will it be weaker than the 4.8 million jobs added to the U.S. economy in June? That figure is published on this Friday, so prepare for a market reaction in that, perhaps especially in the dollar. While we saw sturdy job gains in May and June, well, layoffs, they're now increasing once more. The service industry has again been shrinking activities because of new corona cases. Incidentally, some of the usual seasonal factors aren't happening at the moment either, with a number of manufacturers staying open for the summer instead of closing after being forced to shut earlier in the year. And if you look at U.S. consumer confidence, well, it dropped to a much weaker than expected 92.6 in July. That was a big drop from June and way down from a 20-year high in February. We went from 133 back then to 93 in July, pretty much, so a massive drop. And the key here is that short-term consumer confidence is especially hit. Investors are right to be nervous about the U.S. economic outlook, especially as emergency unemployment benefits worth around $75 billion per month and other measures expired this past Friday. Well, we say unemployment benefits, but really it's a lifeline to thousands and thousands of people. Congress has been looking at a new bill that outlines more financial relief, but it's uncertain when a deal could be reached and what the result could be. The impact of open money taps, or stimulus, is of course a ballooning U.S. fiscal deficit, and Fitch Ratings has responded to this by downgrading the U.S.'s AAA rating to negative. It had been unstable. While it's much easier to criticize government solutions than it is to come up with solutions oneself, EU leaders opposite the U.S. are now being lauded for their cross-border cooperation in last month's 750 billion euro economic rescue plan, which includes debt sharing.
Incidentally, this has also meant an upgrade to the EU rating outlook from Standard & Poor's to a positive from a stable. Now, while many wouldn't trade on rating outlooks, it underscores the US-EU divide once again, also seen, for an example, in that strong euro-weak dollar trade. At the same time, seeing the amount of euro longs versus the dollar also makes you ask for how long the euro momentum trade will remain intact. The equivalent to that prickly dollar in fixed income would be the yield on the US 10-year, around a half a percent, adjusted for inflation expectations, and it looks even more prickly, down at a record low, below minus 1%. Now, as for the dollar direction, and assuming the obvious importance of, for an example, the Fed, the general market, and political stability, so much now hinges on continued aid from the government. In tandem with fighting COVID-19 and treating the sick, if there aren't enough rehabilitation and support measures, an economic recovery is only going to be so much harder. And then it won't just be the dollar running out of steam and having to start over again and again. Now, I mentioned long-term investing. If we accept that COVID-19 is here for the time being, and that it could ebb and flow for who knows how long, then bigger picture thematic investing for the long term becomes even more interesting. These are the themes that will continue to grow and develop regardless of the coronavirus, or maybe even helped along by it. These are the huge themes that you need to be aware of that will change life as we know it over the next years and decades. Alex Guntz is the manager of the Heptagon Future Trends Equity Fund at Heptagon Capital. He researches and looks at ways to invest in bigger changes happening in areas like technology, demographics, alternative energy, health, food, and more. Inspired by history books, he's been galvanized by what he calls the Rubicon Thesis. Take a listen. Alex, you've, uh, you've written about something called the Rubicon Thesis. Explain what is it? Sure. The Rubicon thesis is something which is sort of so exciting, it applies to multiple areas. And we're really using this historic idea of when Julius Caesar took his armies across the Rubicon, went on to conquer the Roman Empire. And very simply, what the metaphor means is that once you start doing something, there is no turning back. And based on the behavior changes that I think we've all undergone during this very strange period of the last few months, the habits we have developed now we believe are going to be very, very difficult to undo in the future. Put very simply, it is this idea that we are becoming or have become digital by default. So what are some of the kind of the, the main ways that you think uh, investing is going to, to turn forward? Um, sure. I mean, I, I would say think, think about it from the perspective of being at home and how we're behaving. So we, it's abundantly obvious that people are making more and more online purchases. And even, even if you think about a company as big as Amazon, despite the fact that Amazon's been going for 20 plus years, it's done $280 billion of revenues last year. The growth they reported last Thursday was 40% year on year growth. That's their fastest growth they've done in nine years. So it's pretty obvious that we're shopping online more. But to my mind, what's really exciting is actually thinking about the infrastructure that underpins that. I'll just give you two really quick examples. Number one is payment. Think about how, or you know, for any any of your your viewers of this, when was the last time that anyone went to a cash machine and withdrew cash? Uh, there was a great study that actually came out from Visa overnight, saying that um, eighty percent, seventy eight percent of consumers said, "Look, you know, we are going to not go back to cash." Uh, in, in, in a post-pandemic world. That's a great example of Rubicon crossing, if you will. Uh, another really good example is think about all of this online stuff. There's a great statistic from a company called Prologis. Prologis is the biggest owner of industrial warehouses globally. For every one percentage point shift that you have in uh, retail sales from physical to online, you need about 46 million more square feet of warehouse space. That's pretty amazing. Just think about it like this. You've got higher inventory turns. Uh, you've got a much longer tail. That's always been the Amazon idea that you can buy anything. You have a much greater range in a warehouse than you'd ever have in a physical store. And then practically, when you're getting goods to a Tesco or a John Lewis or whatever it might be, they go on a pallet. Uh, in, a, in an online world, everything is packetized and you need more space for that as well. And, and this carries through into into other sectors, I'm assuming, as well. It's not just tech it could, or, or, or it's tech in under, for example, energy. 
I, I would say that that's totally the case because I think you know again think about this idea of no turning back that we see with with energy. You know, all of us, whether we're in London or New York or anywhere else, really appreciate how how much cleaner the air feels. You know, there are fewer planes um, uh, uh, out and about in the sky. And I'll, I'll just give you a great statistic. Apologies, it's another um, U, more UK specific one, but it's incredibly relevant. I think there's applicability in most other geographies. The UK has now not burned coal for three months, which is quite amazing, really. Ten years ago, to give you a statistic, 40% of the UK's energy actually came from coal. So what's basically happened is there's been this substitution effect away from fossil fuels to renewable fuels. That's pretty impressive. Year to date, renewables has generated a bigger share. For those of your listeners who aren't familiar with this, the biggest offshore wind turbine in the world uh, is actually in the UK. 120 kilometers off the, uh, the, the the North Sea. Uh, it's the size of Malta. I mean, that's just crazy. It's turbines, uh, the, the arc of the turbines, each one is the size of the London Eye. So you're actually going to this shift. And I think it's very hard to, again, to, 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 to go back, if you will, to the other side of the Rubicon, um, where in 2018, globally, two thirds of, uh, of the world's energy was provided by fossil fuels. By 2050, two thirds of that energy will come from renewable. So as Alex implied via his Rubicon thesis, there's no going back, and not either from investment themes that will transform society, how we live, and how we see the future. It's always interesting when companies go unicorn, and I want to tell you about a recent one. Infobeep was founded 14 years ago in 2006 as a software startup, more particularly as a Croatian cloud communications firm. It's headquartered in London and Croatia in Zagreb and Bodnjan, and it operates in 190 countries. What makes it interesting is that it allows companies to communicate with customers through a bunch of channels like text, like WhatsApp, Viber, Facebook Messenger, by providing technology and omni-channels marketing. And that's a fancy way of saying a seamless experience for the customer who's, for an example, sitting at home shopping. Now, private equity group One Equity Partners has just injected an investment of $200 million into Infobeep. This show of confidence means that the company now is valued at over a billion dollars, which means that it's not only a unicorn company, but it's also the first Croatian unicorn company. It's Infobeep's first outside funding round, and according to Reuters' exclusive sources, Infobeep will be able to expand more in the U.S. The company is profitable, and it generated revenue of around 600 million euros last year, which was a 38% jump year on year, according again to the Reuters sources. They also already have a lot of big name customers like Uber, Costco, Burger King, Unilever, Raiffeisen Bank, that's the Austrian bank, Sparebank in Russia. Tech EU states, quote, the company boasts 600 plus direct to carrier connections, which enables it to connect its business to a potential 7 billion people and things. The company caught my attention as COVID-19 is forcing this acceleration in tech usage. And as we've been talking about, once new habits or new technology is introduced to a company, chances are we won't go back. Along those lines, according to the same report, Infobeep precisely saw a 20% spike in SMS volumes during April, so during lockdown, compared to February, with businesses shifting to reach customers through virtual communications. The Reuters sources seem to think that Infobeep now will be focusing on more U.S. expansion, possibly through acquisitions, and that an IPO in the U.S. also could be on the cards in the future. So beep beep, or Infobeep Infobeep, watch this space. And you can now get the big conversation from Refinitiv as a flash update on your Alexa device or Google Assistant. And if you want to know more about how to download it to your smart speaker, please go to refinitiv.com forward slash flash briefing.